Uh, I'm Emmanuel. Uh, I initially trained as a cardiologist and I practiced for about 23 years until I changed to immunization about 10 years ago. And I live in a country that has a lot of challenges. But I want to appreciate the organizers of this program and the Sanofi and everybody for inviting us from a developing country, multiple problems, problems of security, problems of diseases, both infectious, non-infectious, and even neglected diseases, problems of infrastructural decay or erosion or not availability, and the way it is very difficult to do business. Now, what I'm going to do is to give you a story, and I'm happy that I'm giving this story at this time because um, after a very good dinner, you have a dessert. Of course, you know that dessert usually are often forgotten, or people may not even take them, and they are never had call. And uh, after you take your dessert, up, you be a very good dinner, then you go to sleep. What I'm going to do is to tell a story in 10 minutes of what happens in Nigeria, and perhaps maybe that one represents what happens in all the African countries. We are really living in a challenging environment, and I've, I've told you before, of course, many of you know. And I'm not saying anything new here, because most of what I'm going to say, I'm sure most of you have known it. Many of you here have worked in Africa or in uh, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Now, when I was communicating with Cindy and uh, the organizers, the first intuition was to talk on vaccine acceptance. But we started a program where we wanted to really look at the dynamics of what influence uptake of vaccines, especially in Nigeria. We were looking at the issue of access, equity, the issue of politics, and so on and so forth. So I was busy communicating around forth. And when I came yesterday, I now prepare for vaccine acceptance. When I came and I saw how the whole thing was going, I had to take permission that, look, let's talk about equity and how if we improve on equity, how it's going to make things happen. Because of all evidences to show that acceptance really is a problem, but it's not a major problem in our environment. The major problem in our environment is to create an atmosphere where people will want to accept it, because they know no mother wants a child to die anyway. Uh, so I will tell this story, and at the end of the day, I will we gladly welcome your orientation and your contribution to see what we're going to do or what we are. Uh, I would want to go through the profile of Nigeria, the context of my engagement here, then the issue of equity, and what is the next thing. You look at Nigeria runs a federal system, 36 states, geopolitical zones. Uh, we run a presidential executive system with a fiscal federation, but fiscal or financial uh, non-autonomy. And each of the governors, 36 governors, you know, they are very strong. And Mr. President cannot throw them in how, but they have to go to Mr. President every time to ask for money. Now, this population is about good, almost good 170 million. Of course, this structure have to seen up there. We have a bath cohort of almost 7 million. Uh, with over, surely now over 30,000 immunization sites. Majority of people live above poverty, below poverty line, and the uh, truth that almost about 50 percent live less than 1.5 dollars a day, and over 60 percent of all the health expenses are out of out of pocket. Now, the context, therefore, of what I want to talk about of my story is that. Here you are, you have a large country, large population, with large economy. We've just recently rebased our GDP per capita, which threw us from $1.4 or $1,500 per, you know, to about $2,400 or $2,500, which has, again, thrown us from low income to medium income category by Gavi standardization. Now, the country's constitution itself is one of the problems that is impeding health, because health it's a concurrent issue in Nigerian constitution. That means federal can make its own law on health. Each of the states can make their own laws on health. We used to say that we have 37 health systems in Nigeria, or better still, we used to say we have 841 health systems in the country. Because you have federal 36 states plus FCT, 
Then you also have 774 local government areas. Unlike defense, that is controlled only by Pacto. Now, and in the constitution that we are presently operating, health occurs there, you mentioned health there in less than 10 places. As opposed to education, we occurs in about 340 places in the present constitution. The, our health system is so challenging, I go over that. Uh, we are struggling to go over the MDGs, and then we are, we are preparing, of course, because it's not possible to achieve all the MDGs in less than 100, uh, in less than 200 days from now. But we are preparing for at least the post-2050 MDGs in line with the African social development agendas, uh, the kit of vaccines, and of course, all other uh, programs. We, therefore, we believe strongly, and I will show you some of the figures, that if you do correct access and create a level playing ground by enhancing inequality, then we probably may get better coverage, and that's our conviction. Here you are, a country with a very large population, uh, and here you are, a country that is a giant of Africa. So if it must happen in the world, I want to say that it has to happen in Nigeria. Because one out of every black, five black person is in Nigeria. One out of every three black, three West African is from Nigeria. One out of every four African is in Nigeria. So that's the essence. But the health, health system is so laden with a lot of burdens. So many things you can imagine, can think of it. Let me just state clearly that I'm not painting a gloomy picture. I'm just being realistic. Because my culture says, if you want to be helped, let people know the truth. Because if you do not know what you don't even know, nobody can help you. Now, but again, we have a very weak system. The engine is weak. The structure itself is weak. So where can this one lead you to? Above all, the health workers, people that are supposed to do this job, they are so poorly motivated, and they, they are so engaged. Many of them are doing multiple functions. You will recall that I was not present at the group discussion because while I was here, I had, I had to do this, I had to do that, as if I was the only one there. And you know, it has to happen before 12 o'clock, it has to happen before 1 o'clock, especially on Ebola. I have to give some directives and so on and so forth. So I had to be, excuse myself, I went into the computer room to do that. That is the nature. I'm sure if my minister is here, he won't even stay for one minute before he goes out on telephone. It's a telephone. That's the nature of our work. It decreases efficiency, it decreases concentration. But major cause of death in Nigeria, just unlike most African countries, you know, that's the problem there. But you know that pneumonia, diarrhea, measles, they are all vaccine preventable, and uh, they contribute significantly. To, so if you get vaccination right, you are most likely going to get at least reduced greatly the morbidity and mortality from ch childhood diseases. But with all this one, we have a fluctuating present fluctuation. Uh, coverages of, 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 uh, of, of vaccination. This is DPT3, which is a proxy indicator. We are right now on, on PENTA. If you look at it from 20, 2005 and, 2000 and 2012 that I've tried to plot on the graph there, it goes up and down. There is no constant. And one thing is that most of the states, of course, administratively, some of them have hit 80% coverage of DPT3. But by validation, when used the WHO UNICEF best estimates, we are still in the region of about 50 something percent, which is extremely very low. Now, I've told you that the possibility of getting to the MDG, especially the goals four and five, though we are making a lot of efforts, but it's, uh, it's not feasible within the next couple of days that we need to hit 2015. But above all this, we still have unfinished business in polio. And now Ebola is coming. Polio, we have as of now about six cases, and the most of them are in Kano. The remaining ones are in the security challenge area of Bono State, not, not eastern part of the country. But we are making efforts and we are sure that we're going to get there. Ebola is coming this year. It's a huge problem in West Africa. It will be a very huge problem in Nigeria if not because of the way government, Mr. President, took ownership of the program. 
I will tell you that if the way Nigeria responded to Ebola is how we have always been responding to health, we'll be inviting you to give you presentations and tell you this is how you should do it in America. What are you doing there? This is how you should do it. Yeah, because up to three times the president called the governors, the governors will rush there. They don't do it. The president called them for so many others for polio. They send their deputies, and the deputies may even send one secretary and just go there. But for Ebola, perhaps maybe because it kills, and perhaps maybe because of contact, because of so many things, the entire biological characteristics and clinical presentation and characteristics of Ebola has made everybody to be afraid. So that's, a, that's part of the burden. So issues of coverages, issues of vaccine uptake, Sometimes you wonder where you want to start. Do you have to start with policy? Are there no policy? There are policies. But who is listening to this policy? Who is funding this policy? Legislation, I've told you about that. Issue of governance, of course, yesterday I was shouting myself, Hwase, over the issue of governance in Nigeria. Ignorance, knowledge, attitude, perception. Issue of poverty, inequality and felt needs. Many people want to take vaccine, but they tell you that, look, if you don't give me anti-malaria, if I can't get malaria free, I they just forget about your vaccine. Or if there's no road for me even to bring my products from the farm, forget about it. And as I'm telling you now, only about one fifth, about 20, 20-22% of the country, or less than that, we have power, regular power supply, like most of power six hours a day. Then what about the politics? People want to own this, the economy, ownership of even the products that we are selling in vaccination. People want to come in to buy vaccine themselves. They don't want UNICEF to do it because huge sum of money is going there. People want to bring some vaccine from all over the whole places and they want to, they want, they want to, the WHO is in Geneva. We want to have, we want to use what, what you know, we are not sure what they are bringing. Fake drugs, fake everything. So we now see what do we do? What can we tackle? We want to appreciate the works of most of our partners here who have helped Nigeria in a very tremendous way. Many of you have risked your lives. You've come around to so many things. But I felt that one of the ways that we can graduate, we are working up, at least in my office and first and with my staff now, is let us deal with the issue of equality of access and equality of opportunities. And in doing so, I just put it graph. I took it from a book called The Spirit Level by, I think it's by Wilkinson and, uh, and Pickett, that she's, you know, when you improve equality in a society, you make society to get better. And the extrapolation where I put Nigeria there is entirely mine. I did a small modeling. And I saw that, I thought that, well, Nigeria will have very high income inequality. That's true. Uh, but again, when you look at UNICEF index of well-being, it's, it's extremely very low. So we are below down there. Now, what it means is that you have multiple problems. Countries like, like Finland that has better index, and they, of course the inequality is low. It's almost like they have no problem. Sometimes we wonder what they are discussing all about. <laughs> now, if you look at part of the inequality I'm telling you all about, this diagram shows the health facilities that provide immunization, as well as those that are providing uh, antenatal services. The northwest part of the country, the northeast part of the country, and the north central part of the country, they are all in the northern part. The part that is most deprived, the part where we have a lot of security challenges, but those are again the parts where you have less, less facilities, those are the parts where we are struggling to make sure that you have more immunization posts. Even right home, there's an inbuilt design for inequality. Now, if you look at uh, coverages, of course, when you don't have most of these facilities, again, on the left side of, the, of, of, of this diagram are these northern parts of the country. And on the right side, you know, at the southern part of the country, for the place where I come from. And there's coverages in the northern part of the country where you have the Boko Haram, where you have polio, where you have a lot of stunting, where you have a lot of ignorance and all sorts of things. 
is still low compared to other parts of the country. Then again, this, is, this one illustrates much, much more granularly. Because if you look at national level, the number, um, number of unimmunized countries is approximately about one quarter of, uh, of the Dubaf cohort, which is, um, well, it's not 5 million in Nigeria. It's approximately about 1.5 to 2 million Nigerians or children you know, that are not fully immunized, that are not immunized. But if you look at all the other zones, the southwest zone, the south, anywhere you see S south, they are usually better than the north. And look at the number of immunized, the number of those that have vaccine immunization, and the number of those that are fully immunized is still better in the southern part of the country than in the northern part of the country. Let me just interject that Ebola is in the south, polio is in the north, security issues in the north. If Ebola has happened in the north, or if uh, uh, the, uh, the librarian that brought Ebola to Nigeria has landed in the north, it would have been a different story entirely. But because of a fairly stronger system, fairly good political stability and ownership in that part of the country, it was possible to quickly uh, deal with it. Now, when again, we look at the Wealth Culture Index in Nigeria, and again, this is uh, the DPT3 coverage where those who are earning higher and those who are living in urban settlements and those who have the opportunity of taking their children to Europe and America have higher coverage of a DPT3 and in fact Penta as opposed to those who are poor. It's just very graphical. Now, if you look at again the child mortality compared to the wealth quantile, this is a, a natural phenomenon. But those who are poor have higher burden and then those who are low, those who are very rich have lower burden. Uh, now, in, for vaccination, what are the reasons that we have tried to ascribe as reasons for this of, of inequality? They have told you about geographical inequalities like urban, rural differentiation, to regional and states, the socioeconomic status, issues like gender, education awareness, proximity to immunization centers, uh, and lack of you know outreach and sensitization uh, as some of the issues you know that have created this inequality in service inequality in access uh, and what we have tried to do is to see what we can deal with and also to design program that would look at what we cannot deal with immediately what we believe that we can deal with immediately are the issue of legislation now we are in the process of revising the constitution of the country. So we have taken the issues to the NGOs, taken these issues to, uh, to all other stakeholders to ensure that child rights is law and we obey all the African and international chapters on, on child health and child rights and convention. And I want to tell you something, that in Nigeria, some states have made law that if you don't vaccinate your child, or if you are refusing some vaccines or you are refusing vaccine, you can be jailed. There is, the, yes, it has to happen because you need to use drastic measure to deal with drastic situation. If you want to follow the, the Western world, the Northern the Hemisphere, I say, look, um, there's right here, right here, and they're right there, then we are not going to win the battle. And uh, I was telling you close to about 19, that's almost about 50% of the state, they are trying to legislate on vaccination. I said, look, you must, as a matter of fact, vaccinate your child. But the issue is, if you are not legislated that we should vaccinate their child, are you providing the right environment? Are you giving all what is necessary? Are you addressing their first needs that will want, make them want to take your vaccine? Now, the national health policy is, recognizes that, of course, primary health care is at the local government level. But that is the lower, that's the lowest level of governance. But that is the level that takes less than 20% of national income or national fund. Um, that's part of go government you know, that is expected to take care of over 80% of, of the health needs of the people. That is very paradoxical. The National Health Bill, some of you are aware, struggling to have it. Uh, well, it's been passed by both houses, uh, the National Assembly, and we are awaiting that Mr. President will give his assent. But the issue is, even when the National Health Bill is signed into law and it becomes law, it will hardly address the issue of vaccination or immunization in Nigeria. Because at the end of the day, what comes from that health bill for immunization 
It's in the region of about 15 billion naira. How much is it now in dollars? Which is just 25% of what you even need for a vaccination in the year 2016, when Gavi will have almost started packing his load away from Nigeria. So where do we go? Now, we have again tried to see what, perhaps maybe if we have the primary, state primary health care development agencies, you know, like I'm from National Primary Health Care Development Agency, we have replicated it in all the states by legislation, then you may be able to have some good ownership and accountability for vaccination and other primary health care activities at the state level, and so on and so forth. Now, what therefore are our next steps? I must tell you that sometimes we are confused that we don't even know what should be the next steps. We are confused not because we don't learn from people, but we are confused because no matter how you design your program, but it's not funded. No matter how you design your program, but political expediency overrides all your technical and all your evidences, you become confused. But we believe that there are things we can still do. One is that for the health worker, they need better understanding. Health worker need to participate. They need to, you, you, you see, you cannot, when policies are drawn and you are not there, then you will be reacting to the policies implementation every time. But when you are there, you only respond. Of course, response is good, reaction is negative. Uh, we are encouraging our people, not even only to participate in policy, but also to go into politics. But when you get to the politics in my climb, that is the only way you can get assured that you will have some funds to do vaccination and to do immunization, to correct inequalities and to build more trust with the people. Uh, we believe that um, our advocacies, our advocacies, you know, have to, to be targeted, have to be unbiased, and have to be pragmatic. I we told you yesterday that we have no problem with, with uh, making advocacies but we have a problem with people listening to our advocacies. We thought that perhaps maybe our advocacies were not in the right direction, so we tried to retool. And uh, here we are on top. My take home message here is that we will appeal to all our development partners and all countries that are strong countries that are here that please tell whoever is up there in the country that they have to get things right. We have been trying, we try our best to do so. But it's just that they, people don't listen. They don't listen. And I will tell you that as I'm still speaking now, close to about 50, 55 of the budget for routine immunization this year is not available. We have not been given. And uh, this is September. We are on the end of September. If Gavi is not in Nigeria, if partners are not in Nigeria, there will have been no deputy, <laughs> deputy coverages. Pardon me, there will be no deputy. You have no vaccine whatsoever. That is the truth about it. Now, the question that somebody asks is, what happens when Gabi goes away? What happens when we withdraw? Is there going to be nothing that will happen? Something will happen. I think it may, it, uh, it, it, it may metamorphose into to some, some form of, of, of revolution. I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's, it definitely still have to happen. Uh, and finally on this is that I would want to, and I keep ad making this statement anyway, have the opportunity that whether they like it or not, I'm a civil servant, and so I'm liable to whatever statements I make, that people should not come to Nigeria and give them grants, give us credit. Because if you give grants, people are never serious if it is free money. But if you give credit and tie the credit, the repayment of this credit to key performance indicators, as we do in polio buy down, then people will be serious. People will be very, very accountable to what they are spending. And uh, so it makes a lot of difference. So I think, again, these are, you have various ways of, of digesting this information to, 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 the, to, 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 uh, to, to the countries. Uh, what are the new things that we can do? What are the new models that we can employ to ensure that we bring issue of equity to fall and address non-felt need or felt needs in the country and, and so that we can have increased coverage. I was discussing with one of the prominent members of these people, and they were talking of, of a Gini index. And you know, well, I think those are very good things and are very good ways to go so that we can tie development and tie economic realities to, to the performance and, and see is there a way we can build uh, the issue of performance uh, to election, 
in Nigeria. Uh, we have tried that one, but because whether you vote or you don't vote in many countries in Africa, people will see a merge. That's why it does not work. I would very much appreciate whatever further orientation you can give to my story uh, so that at least I will have something I'm taking home. I've already taken a lot of lessons home. And please, you will not be tired of, 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 of us. Furthermore, the last but one slide is that we are trying to do deep dives into addressing this issue of inequalities, and then we also design some some protocols to look at how the the various economic and political drivers to immunization in Nigeria how they are playing out. Um, uh, of, of course, the need for us to address critical gap, you know, has also been taken on board. You know, the issue of vaccination of the extremely very young and very old the issue of maternal vaccination and so on and so forth. And we believe that uh, having listened to my uh, uninteresting story, your suggestions and further orientation, you'll be very, extremely, very helpful for us in the country. Now, we believe that our children don't need to wear a gloomy face at all. They definitely will want, also want to laugh, like the children in the city of London, in the street of New York, in the street of Paris. That is what they want. But it's a difficult thing. And I will pity them. Um, in closing, I would appreciate this foundation for making it possible for me to come. And I'm, I'm happy for Angus for uh, realizing that some other emerging economies like Brazil, India, and so on and so forth, if they are here, to be good. And some other countries in Africa can also come. It's a very good opportunity. My colleagues in the agency, I appreciate them. All our partners that have risked their lives coming to Nigeria, and they are still in the country now, moving all over. You are not sure where the next bullet is going to hit. We appreciate all of you. Uh, we appreciate some of our colleagues in the academics, uh, the lady there that, you know, she's very passionate about inequalities and we are could designing the protocol to really do a deep dive into the issue of inequality, especially in immunization in Nigeria together. Uh, but last but not the least is to, to really appreciate the audience, you people for listening to a presentation that is not leading by the p-values and by the graphs and, and the, all the tables, but a presentation that tends to present a gloomy picture of, uh, are you sure this thing is really happening, it's happening? Uh, but uh, we can overcome it. But we need you to help us to do it. Um, we want to thank all of you, the UN agencies, for what you have done, the bilaterals. Uh, so many people, I too much to, to mention. Gabi, US government, US aid, and CDC, Chai, UK aids, DFID, MCH2 have just come to the country. Then we have uh, the Canadian government, SIDA. Uh, we have JICA, we have Norway, we have South Korea, we have German, uh, KFW, they have been supporting. We have uh, so many groups that are supporting us. Thank you. On behalf of Nigerian children, I want to thank you.